Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to finish this chapter this morning. That's the plan. Amen. We've spent over two and a half years going through Matthew's gospel record together. Uh, that's something we talked about, though, when I came as pastor just over three years ago, is that we want to be committed to preaching and teaching the whole counsel Amen. of God's Word. Amen. Um, I was talking with some people this week and, and, and just about the, the way we want to preach through things and cover all the verses. and I, I made the statement that I can be funny. <laughs> and they laughed at that, too. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I can be. Right? They didn't believe me. I don't get. But but that's that's not the job, right? The job up here is not to be a stand-up comedian. The job is not to be entertaining. The job is not to tell you a bunch of stories about me. Amen. The job that is given to the pastors from the scriptures to preach the whole counsel of God's Amen. word. Amen. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to cherry pick. We don't want to skip around somewhere all the time. We want to cover every verse. We don't want to skip the hard things. We don't want to skip the things that we just assume everybody's familiar with. We want to preach and teach the whole counsel of God's Word. And, and I understand this morning we're closing in on completing Matthew's Gospel account. And we come to a passage that is, for the most part, largely either overlooked or covered very quickly. And, and I understand, right, because I'm anxious too to get to the resurrection and to get to the Great Commission. And I want to get to those things. But this passage is an incredible portion of Scripture. We've been looking at the cross and talking about the death of Jesus. And last week we talked about responding to the cross. And I really, really want to get to chapter 28. Not because I want to be done with Matthew. Right? But because I want to get to the crucifixion. That is the, the most important event in all of human history. The resurrection. I want to get to the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus is the most significant miracle that has ever taken place. And I want to get there. Amen. All right. But between the crucifixion and the resurrection, we have the burial of Jesus. We have the burial of Jesus. And even in the burial, even in the burial, there's this testimony that Jesus is king. Even in the burial of Jesus, we see this evidence that God is in control of this even in the burial, he's in control of what's going on. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Jesus is king, and even in his burial, we see with, without a doubt that he is the sovereign son of God. And so we're going to begin in chapter or in chapter 27 in verse 57 and uh, read through the end of the chapter. So if you're able, if you would, please stand out of reverence for the reading of the word of God. Matthew 27 beginning in verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. <coughs> Excuse me. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his, disciple go, his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Dear Lord, we come before you this morning again and just pray and ask that you would give us clarity where we need it, conviction where we need it, courage to respond to your word where we need it. Lord, that where I can be uh, tongue-tied and muddy things up and, and lose lose my train of thought, Lord, pray that you would, uh, your spirit through your word would work through all of that, work through my imperfections and my shortcomings, Lord, that your word would be proclaimed in a way that you would speak to our hearts and our minds uh, and teach us what it is you have for each of us here this morning. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
So last week, briefly, uh, spoke about Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary a little bit. We're going to look at some other details in these passages this morning, and we're going to start with Joseph of Arimathea. Verses 57 through 60 say that when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen, sh a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. So the first thing I want to talk about is there are two messianic prophecies that are fulfilled. One is from the Old Testament in Isaiah. The other is from the New Testament, something Jesus said about himself, about his burial. And you're probably familiar with Isaiah 53 to some, to some level, right? Isaiah 53, he is pierced for our transgressions, he is crushed for our iniquities. Uh, the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and with his wounds we are healed. Probably familiar with that. But it also says in uh, Isaiah 53, verse 9, that they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. So Isaiah 53 talks a lot about the death of Christ, that, that he's despised and rejected and a man of sorrow, and, and he bore our griefs and all of that. Uh, but it also specifically says that they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. That's, that's a very specific prophecy, and it's, it's almost strangely specific. Strangely specific, and it, it's, it's strange in general. How can a man have his grave made with the wicked and with the rich man? That's a very specific thing. The second one we're going to look at, Jesus said about himself. We, we read this back in Matthew chapter 12, forever ago, right? But back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus said, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so we have these two prophecies about the burial of Jesus. One, that he'll have a grave with the wicked and with the rich man. And two, Jesus said that he would be there for three days. And so how do we make that work? These are very specific prophecies related to the burial of Jesus. Uh, and so that's what we're going to look at. God uses Joseph of Arimathea as the human instrument, if you will, that gets the, the, to fulfill these prophecies. He uses Joseph of Arimathea to see these things through. And so we come to chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 57, and it says, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. Now we've talked about this before, Okay, that the Jews had multiple evenings, the way they broke their day up. And so when it says it was evening, right, uh, the, the first evening, early evening, was 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., kind of the end of the, the daylight hours. And then the Sabbath day, just so you know, the Sabbath day ran from, from 6 p.m. Friday. Uh, it started from 6 p.m. Friday and ran to 6 p.m. the next day. Uh, so it started right from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. was the Sabbath that they recognized. And so it says it was uh, evening that there came a rich man. And, and so Jesus then, just to recap, Jesus is nailed on the cross about 9 in the morning. He's there for three hours. And then from noon to 3, it's dark. And about 3 o'clock, the ninth hour, when he yielded up his spirit. And that's important, okay, because the Sabbath starts at 6. So in order for Jesus to be in the grave on Friday, he has to be, for that to count, for one of the three days, he has to be buried or in the grave before 6 p.m. on Friday. He yielded up his spirit around 3 p.m. on Friday. So he has to be in the grave before 6 p.m. in order for him to be buried on Friday in that count, right? Friday, Saturday, Sunday would be three days. Go look over at John chapter 19, 31 through 37. I'm going to read them to you. But uh, John chapter 19 tells us this is Friday. Right? John 19, verses 30, start verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, 
And so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when he came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it bore witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Amen. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him who they have pierced. And so there's some other prophecies there in John 19 too. But we're, we're drawing our attention to verse 31 mainly. That it's the day of preparation. So that the bodies may not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate to break their legs. We talked about that a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago regarding the details of crucifixion. How we remember they're, they're nailed up there and then they're dropped in that hole and it would pull their shoulders out of socket. And so the, the only way you could get breath because you're stretched out would be to push against the nail in your feet because your, your joints are out of socket up here. You don't have that upper body strength. And in order to get them to die faster sometimes, they'd break their legs so they couldn't push up. So they'd slump down and basically asphyxiate or suffocate under the weight of their body and, 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 and the, the pressure on their lungs. So they're going to do that because they don't want them still on the cross on the Sabbath. So they asked Pilate to go do that. Now, the, the reason they do that, um, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. The reason this matters okay, is because the day of preparation is the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath was Saturday from 6 p.m. Friday night to 6 p.m. Saturday. So when it says it was the day of preparation, we know that's Friday. That's the day of preparation. That goes all the way back to Exodus 16 where God tells them to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And even when they're in the wilderness, it was the day of preparation when they're wandering in the wilderness and God sends manna from heaven. And if you remember, he told them not to collect any to hold it over to the next day. And if they did, it didn't work out. Except, except on the day before the Sabbath, the day of preparation, they could collect enough for both days. And so when it says the day of preparation, that is Friday, without a doubt. That's Friday. That, that, that's important. And so they, they don't want him hung on the cross or the Sabbath uh, because it is not just any Sabbath, but this, this Sabbath is a high day because it is the Sabbath of the Passover. Now we've talked about that for months. Everything that we've read in the last several chapters has all happened within about a week's time. And it's leading up to Passover and they don't want him hung there on that high Sabbath Passover. Why is that? Deuteronomy 21 Deuteronomy 21, 22 and 23 says, If a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land, for the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. And so the Jewish leaders are basing it on that. Now they're thinking about Deuteronomy 21. This guy has been hanged on a cross, and then, you know, wasn't a, a hanging from a tree, but they're connecting the dots there and saying, hey, we cannot let this happen, let them hang overnight. We need them to be dead and buried that same day. And so that's why I asked Pilate to go break the legs, but Jesus had already died. And the, the, the thing is this typically, when a person was crucified, they lingered for several days. Now, that's why they broke their legs. They lingered for a while, and they didn't want to draw out the suffering. Right? But they got to a point where they've got other stuff to do, right? Like we've, we've probably all been that way in some regard. It's this. I'm not trying to make light of this, but I think this is the, the mindset, right? Is everybody knows if you're a deer hunter, and this may be a terrible analogy, but bear with me. Everybody knows that you go into deer season with this mindset of I'm going to wait for a good buck, but then. You start getting into the end of November, early December. It's cold. You're ready to go home. You got other things to do, right? And so if doe walks out, and that's it. Because you got other stuff to do. So they are trying to draw out the suffering on the cross, but there comes a point where it, they would last for days. That's why you read the other gospel accounts that Pilate was surprised that Jesus had expired so soon. Right? Which again, that's evidence that he yielded up his spirit. They weren't in charge of it. But that's why they break their legs to, to kind of speed the death along because they've got other things to do. 
And so uh, their preparation, they don't want him hung on the tree overnight. They want to the, speed that up. And that's what's going on there in John 19. So that's the, Jew, the thinking of the Jewish leaders. Speed this up so we can get their bodies down, so we can get them buried the same day, so they're not defiling the Sabbath based on Deuteronomy 21. And here's what they would do normally right, with the body of criminals. If nobody claims the body, if they're, if they're not from the capital city, whatever, uh, a lot of times they would probably bury criminals in kind of a mass grave, a criminal's grave. Uh, the Romans would commonly uh, to take the, the the body of people they crucified and, and just kind of throw them in pits and things like that. This, this, the, a grave for the wicked, right? It's not a respectful, proper burial. It's a grave for the wicked. And that's what they intended to do with Jesus. Maybe it's Gehenna outside of Jerusalem where Jesus talks about Gehenna where the, the, the kind of the city dump. And there's always fires going. They're always doing something like that. It's a it's it's a, a criminal's grave, a grave for the wicked. That's what they had prepared to do with Jesus. They took him and they would have taken the others and they prepared to put them in a criminal's grave. And Isaiah 53, verse 9 says that they made his grave with the wicked. That's what they're going to do with him. But then here's what happens: Joseph of Arimathea shows up. It says, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. We've read that, right? He goes to Pilate. He asks for the body of Jesus. Pilate gives it to him. And Joseph took the body. He wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb. That he'd cut away the rock and he rolled a stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And so, again, Isaiah 53, they, his, his grave is made with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. So they intend to bury him with the wicked, but then instead he's buried like a rich man. And so that prophecy is fulfilled, that very specific prophecy in Isaiah 53 about being his grave being made with the wicked and the rich man happens because Joseph of Arimathea shows up who is a rich man. That's what he is going to do. Uh, the, the other disciples, we talked about that last week, they're not there. It says Joseph was a disciple, but again, that just means a learner. He's not one of the twelve. But he is, he's there. The other guys aren't there. They fled. They're hiding somewhere for fear of the Jews. The women are there, but the women don't have the resources to bury Jesus. Especially in that culture. And they probably don't own a grave in Jerusalem. They're from Galilee. And, and so they're not able to do this. It has to be taken care of by someone with the resources. Is someone that can get it done quickly so that Jesus is in the grave by 6 p.m. So that Friday counts as one of those three days that Jesus prophesied he'd be in the grave for three days in the heart of the earth. And so a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, who's a disciple of Jesus, right? Not one of the twelve, a follower of Jesus. It means he's a learner. He's learning from Jesus. He's listening to Jesus. He believes what Jesus is saying. He's following Jesus. Okay, he's a disciple. Mark tells us in his gospel account that he's a prominent man. Not only that he's a rich man, but that he's a member of the Jerusalem Council or the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Council. Uh, a respected member of the Council, Mark says, Mark 15, 42 and 43, said when evening had come, since it was a day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, again, making sure it's clear that this is Friday, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the Council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Right, so Joseph of Arimathea is a member of the ruling body that convicted Jesus right, of the crime of being a blasphemer, uh, the claiming he's the son of God, sentenced him to death. Joseph of Arimathea is a member of that council. But Luke tells us this about him. Luke 23, 50 and 51. There was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. Okay, so uh, in another footnote, I didn't put this in here, a lot of details about it, but I do think it's interesting. John 19 tells us Nicodemus is there too. And Nicodemus brought the myrrh and aloes and the aromatic spices and things because they didn't embalm bodies back then like we do, right? They just anointed the body with a lot of spices and oils to keep it preserved a little bit longer right, to keep it from decomposing as quick and, and, and smelling so you could go and, and visit the grave. 
But it tells us in, in John's account, we know that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are, are there. But Joseph is talked about as a good man, a just man. He had not consented to their decision. He was, he was the odd man out and the rest of them wanted to crucify Jesus. It says he's a member of the council, but he did not consent to that. He's genuinely seeking the kingdom of God, it says, genuinely seeking the truth. And the gospel writers all say these things about Joseph of Arimathea, but they make sure to mention to us that he's a rich man, that he's a prominent man. And that's important because it's fulfilling that prophecy. They made us great with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. And so he's a prominent man, a well-connected man, a good man, a rich man, uh, and he's able to approach Pilate and get the body of Jesus for a proper burial. Now here's, here's what I want you to see, okay? That this is, even in the burial of Jesus, God's in control of everything that's going on. Because there's no reason Pilate should give the body to Joseph of Arimathea. He's not a relative. He has no legal right to the body. If anything, he's, he's at least associated with the group of people that Pilate's upset with because they blackmailed him. There's no reason for him to give the body to Joseph of Arimathea other than that God is sovereign over these events. Amen. Right? And so he gives it to Joseph, who's one of the few men that was a follower of Jesus, who owned a grave and had the resources to get this done before 6 p.m. so that he's in the grave by Friday. Fulfilling those prophecies with the wicked and with the rich man and with it being three days. Right? It being three days. And so they get Jesus uh, buried on Friday to fulfill the prophecy Jesus made about himself about three days and three nights. And so Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus said, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And people read that and they want to, you know, kind of be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Skeptical, I guess, or cynical. And say, well, he wasn't in there for three full days and three full nights. Doesn't that mean he has to actually be there for three full days and three full nights? And the answer to that question is no. Right? No, he doesn't have to be there for three full days and three full nights. It doesn't have to be three 24-hour periods. The reason that, that there's a couple problems with that, people who try to make that happen. There are people who try to make it so that Jesus is in there for three full days and three full nights. The problem with that is... The way they do it is they back the crucifixion up to Thursday or even Wednesday. But that's not the day of preparation. And if that is that the way you do it, here's another problem, right? Jesus said that he would rise on the third day. And so if you back it up to Wednesday or Thursday, right? If it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and he rose on Sunday, that's the fourth day. If he goes in the grave on Wednesday, so that Thursday's a full day, Friday's a full day, and Saturday's a full day, then Sunday's still the fourth day. And he didn't rise on the fourth day. Right? So people trying to, to explain this or think it's a problem with the Bible because Jesus said three days and three nights, and so we got to make it fit. right? No, but let's just trust what the Bible says. Let's just let the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures. Let's just trust what Jesus said. And he said he'd rise on the third day. So if he's rising on the third day, that means it's during the third day. So that means from the very get-go, he didn't intend for that to mean three full 24-hour periods. Okay? Because it's on or during some portion of the third day. So that's important. Right? He rose on the third day. Uh, he said in Matthew 17, uh, 22 and 23, As they were gathered in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day. After the resurrection in Luke 24, verse 46, Jesus says that it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day raise from the dead, or rise from the dead. And, and so if we understand that, then we know uh, that, that that's not what he ever intended. He's rising on the third day. Okay? Help you understand this a little bit. If I ask you, what did you do yesterday? What did you do yesterday? And you say, well, I worked outside yesterday. Do you, when you, when I ask you that, you answer that question, are you saying that you worked outside for 24 hours straight? I hope not. If you are, you are you're built different, all right? 
But when I said, what did you do yesterday? You know, I worked out in the yard yesterday. You don't mean 24 hours. You mean for a portion of the day, that's what you did. Right? That was the major event of that day, even though it wasn't the whole 24 hours. If, I, if you're going to, to the lake for, for three days, say, yeah, we're going to go spend three days at the lake. What you probably mean by that is not you're going to spend 72 hours straight at the lake. Yeah. What you mean by that is a portion of three days. Because check in, you know, you get your camper and check in at two or three in the afternoon. That's one day. You stay that night, and then you're all there. You're there all day the next day. And then the next day, you go, you got to check out by like one. You weren't there for three whole 24 hour periods, but you spent three days at the lake, right? And so that's kind of the idea. And in Jesus' explanation of rising on the third day, it's, it's the insinuation is that during that third day, not the whole 24 hour period, but during that third day is when he would rise. That's consistent with the way Jesus talks about his time in the grave and his resurrection. He's going to rise on the third day. And so in order for that to happen, he had to be buried before 6 p.m. on Friday so that Friday would count. And then all day Saturday, and then rise on Sunday, rise on the third day. And so Joseph of Arimathea played a very important role in that. God used Joseph as the human instrument to bring that about and fulfill these specific prophecies about buried with the, the criminals and with the rich man and about three days. Uh, it had to happen by that time, and Joseph's the guy who got done. Something else I want us to see then, there's another group of people. Verse 61 says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. <laughs> that seems really simple, right? That's simple enough. It just says there are these women and they're sitting there opposite the tomb. But we know from what we read of the other writers, that means that Joseph and Nicodemus and everybody else has apparently left. It said that they went away. Verse 60, that Joseph rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And now the two Marys are there. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Now the other Mary has already been identified for us earlier in the chapter. As, uh, as Mary the mother of James it's Mary, Mary the mother of James the lesser or James the less in translation right? obviously there's two guys named James who were part of uh, the, the disciples following Jesus around one of them is big James because he must have been a big man and so the other one was little James that's all that is that's just like today I, when I was growing up there's like nine houses ten houses on the whole street we lived on out in the country and there was two towers and the other Tyler was about a foot shorter than me. So we were big Tyler and little Tyler. That's what everybody on the road calls us, right? That's all that means. James the Lesser doesn't mean less important. He just he was smaller than big James, okay? But that's who these two Marys are. I say that only because sometimes Marys get confusing in the New Testament. Because that was a very popular name, right? It, it's like Brittany in the 90s, okay? It's a very popular, very popular name. But there's two Marys. It's Mary, the mother. There's Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, so that you understand it's not. The other Mary is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. So, anyway, they're sitting there. The idea is that they're there. They're looking at where Jesus is buried. They don't want to leave. They're sorrowful. They love Jesus so much. They just want to stay there. Now, they want to stay there at the tomb, at the grave. And, and we understand that. People do that today. We bury a loved one and we want to stay there for a little bit because we, we love them and we care about them. And then we go back and visit. Matthew 28, the next chapter, verse 1. says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, so now it is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. They're going back. They're, right? They left for the Sabbath because they're going to observe the Sabbath. And then as soon as they can get back out there, they go back out there. We know then that it's after, uh, that, that it's technically the, the next day because the Sabbath runs from 6 to 6. And so anyway, they go back the next day. They want to be there. The other gospel writers tell us that they take some uh, herbs and things there. So maybe they're optimistic about his, his claims to rise from the dead, but it doesn't look that way. Uh, they're just there because they love him. They take spices because they want to continue to keep the body presentable as long as they can. But they go out and they're there. And because they're there, we, we'll read this next week, but they experience the earthquake and the angel comes and speaks to them and the stones roll. They experience all this incredible stuff because they're there. 
because of the commitment to Jesus. Right? And again, I don't I do not think they were there expecting the resurrection, even though they'd heard him teach that. Because if that's what they're expecting, they wouldn't have taken the stuff to put on the body. But they're there. And so no matter how feeble their faith might have been, they're there because of their faith and their love for Jesus. And God uses that too. Because what happens is they experience the earthquake and the stone and the angel and they have this first-hand eyewitness account. So first, Joseph of Arimathea, God sovereignly uses Joseph to have these other prophecies fulfilled. And then these women are there and God uses them to provide eyewitness testimony. These faithful and committed women. Right? The providence of God to fulfill His will and His purposes. And it says that when Jesus had risen on the first day in Mark 16, that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, and she went and told those who had been with him. And so this eyewitness testimony that's provided, I think that's incredible. That even in the burial, there's these women who God makes sure that they're there when these events start to happen, and the earthquake and the angel and all that takes place, and he was raised from the dead. There's a third group I want us to look at. It's a little bit surprising, but it's, to me, my favorite or the most interesting one. Verses 62 through 66. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. So that would mean it's during the Sabbath, which is weird. I don't know. There's some speculation here. I don't want to go too deep with this. But they're so concerned about not violating the Sabbath that they want the bodies off the cross. But they go meet with this pagan Gentile ruler on the Sabbath, which they shouldn't have done either. Right? Just a very twisted way of thinking that they had. But anyway, they go uh, before Pilate and they said, Sir, we remember how the imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I'll rise. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he's risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So he gives them a guard to do that. And they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And here's what's amazing about that. That God uses the chief priests and the Pharisees, God uses the the enemies of Christ to give evidence to the deity of Christ. He uses the enemies of Christ to give evidence to the deity of Christ. And here's the thing. Here's their mindset. The fact that he was dead wasn't good enough for them. They wanted to totally squash the movement. Right? They wanted to, to totally be done with the movement. And so they tell Pilate, he said he's going to raise after three days. And we want to make sure that nothing happens so that we can prove once and for all that he's not who he said he was. Because they're thinking, hey, you know, we got to do something so that, so that his disciples don't come steal the body. And I want you to understand that. The reason they put the guard there and seal the tomb is not because they're afraid that he's going to actually rise from the dead. They say he said he's going to do this. And we don't want his disciples to fake it. Because they don't believe he's the Messiah. They don't believe he's the Son of God. They don't believe he's going to rise from the dead. But they believe that his disciples will try to do something to fake it. <coughs> That's what they're afraid of. Now nothing in the New Testament gives us any indication that the disciples had ever even thought about doing that. For one, because even when Jesus told them he was going to rise again, they didn't get what he was talking about. Until after he's risen, then they're like, oh, that now I get it. Right? But they, there's nothing that, if anything, we, we have no reason to believe that they would. We have reason to believe they wouldn't. Because where are they at when all this is going on? They're hiding in the upper room. For what reason? For fear of the Jews. They're afraid, so they're hiding. They're not going to go out and risk getting caught. They're afraid. But the Pharisees and the chief priests say, this is what they might do, so we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So put this guard there and, and secure this and make sure that the disciples can't steal the body and make up a story about resurrection. That's what they try to do. It says in verse 56, so they went and they made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. They sealed it and put soldiers there to guard it. And here's why that's amazing to me. 
that, that, that that's specifically recorded. And that's not just recorded here. There's other historical, extra biblical writings from other historians that record in that time period there was a guard set up the tomb. But here's why that's incredible to me. Because there are people today who still want to try to say that the, if the tomb's empty, it's because the disciples stole the body and faked the whole thing. There are people today who still try to argue that. Okay? And the reason they do, we see later, is because the Pharisees paid the guards to lie about what happened, and that story is still spread to this day, it says. But there's people who believe that. And here's what you have to believe. In order to believe that the disciples stole the body and faked the whole thing, you have to believe a couple, a couple things. You have to first of all believe that the disciples were willing to be tortured and, and killed in terrible ways for something that they knew wasn't true. People don't do that. But here's what you also have to believe. You have to believe that these blue-collar fishermen, average Joes, overpowered Roman soldiers, moved the stone, carried the body away without getting caught or stopped or a Roman soldier blowing them a horn to get other soldiers to come help. Right? You have to believe that. Now here, if nobody's watching the tomb and there's no guard, sure, they could have made up all kinds of claims to explain an empty tomb. But because the guard's there and the tomb is sealed, the only explanation for the empty tomb is that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. Amen. And God used the enemies of Christ to put official government soldiers, government officials there to make sure that there's no other explanation other than he rose from the dead. That's the providence of God, that Joseph of Arimathea, we, we read in other gospel accounts that he'd been a follower of Jesus for some time, but in secret because he was afraid of the Jews. And at this moment, when we need this man to provide this rich, his rich man's borrowed tomb and to get the body, in the, at this time, he's bold. God uses him. These women... Right? They don't have the resources, but they're there because they love God uses them and provides eyewitnesses to the resurrection and the earthquake and the angel and all that that we're going to read about later. And even using these, these enemies of Jesus and pagan soldiers, pagan soldiers, to give undeniable evidence that the only explanation for the empty tomb is that Jesus rose from the dead. The soldiers go back and say what happened. And the Pharisees say, don't tell people that. We'll pay you to lie, right? We'll pay you to lie. Why pay them to lie? Because even they knew the only logical explanation, given the fact that the tomb was sealed and the guards were there, is that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. And I think that's an incredible, right? Just the sovereignty of God, even in the burial of Jesus, that Joseph's there and the women are there when they need to be, and the Roman soldiers are there right when God needs them to be. To prove that he is who he claims yeah. to be. Amen. So the question then this morning is, what are we supposed to do with that? Right? What are you and I supposed to do with that? Well, the one thing I hope at the very least is it gives us a better understanding of Romans 8.28. Because Romans 8.28 is, is quoted often and usually out of context. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Right? So here's the idea. God is sovereign. God's sovereignty and his providence is not some distant thing. It's not something that theologians just talk about, right? It's real. Yeah. And it's true. And so this event seems terrible. That's why the women are there. They're in mourning over the body of Christ. Joseph of Arimathea is doing what he's doing because he feels that he, he, he wants there to be some reverence for the death of Christ. The, the soldiers are there out of wicked intent, right? So even these things that seem terrible, Jesus just died, he's been buried, and all hope seems lost to everybody there watching it. And even in that kind of situation, God worked all of it out for his will and purposes. Amen. All of it. Not just Joseph of Arimathea and the women, not just believers, he worked out even using these pagan soldiers for his will and purposes. 
And so how, what do we do with that? Well, we can look at this and for one, theologically, we can say that this is evidence that Jesus is who he says he is and the tomb is empty and he is raised from the dead. But we can also look at this and say that God is sovereign in my life. Uh, God's in, in control of my life. When I can't explain something or I don't understand things that are going on in my life or whatever's happening in life, when I can't understand and I struggle with things or things don't make sense or whatever trials I might be going through, that the sovereign God of the universe works those things out for our good and for His glory. For our good and for His glory. That's demonstrated here with Joseph of Arimathea and the women and even the pagan soldiers and Pilate and the chief priests and the Pharisees, the enemies of Christ. God used it to set things up for the resurrection to be undeniable, right? For his will and glory. And so again, right, if you are one of those who love God, Romans 8, 28, for those who love God, and you're one who is called according to his purpose, we know that he works things out for, for good. And that's his good and our good, our good and his glory. And so this morning as we wrap this up, I would just encourage you, on the one hand, as a believer, to understand right, that this is a passage that's overlooked a lot. We talk about Jesus being buried, and we skip that. It gets to the resurrection. But in the burial of Jesus, there's this incredible evidence that God's in control of all of this, and God used even the burial of Jesus. We talked about it a couple weeks ago that at the crucifixion, we see God's sovereignty and glory on display, right? And at the resurrection, we certainly see God's sovereignty and glory on display. But even in the burial, we see God's sovereignty and glory on display. Also, as a believer, I want you to understand this. There are things that are going to go on in your life, and there's two options, right? On the one hand, maybe it's just because it's your fault. Now, let's be honest about that. Sometimes bad things happen because I'm a sinner, and I have to deal with the consequences of my sin. And other times there are things in my life that I don't understand, like the disciples and the women, they didn't understand what was going on. But later on, I can look back and see that God was working those things out for my good and for His glory. Amen. The other thing, if you're here if you're, or you're listening and you're not a believer, and you say, listen, I don't know about Jesus stuff. I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know if I believe that. It just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, there's not that much. I, mean, I just need to see more evidence. Listen, yeah, we can spend, I can spend hours with you. I can give you so much evidence, you'll be sick of hearing evidence. All right? The reason people don't believe is not because of the lack of evidence. I say this all the time. There's plenty of evidence. The reason people don't believe in Jesus or don't believe the Bible or don't follow what it says is not because of the lack of evidence, because they don't want to. But, but if you're here and that's you and you're an unbeliever, I want you to understand something undeniable that Jesus is who he said he was. Undeniable that he did rise from the dead. Undeniable. Not just scripturally, historically. There's all kinds of extra biblical historians that wrote about these accounts. And so if you're here and you're a believer, I pray that God would speak to your heart and mind from these passages and you trust him and understand his sovereignty and his providence and that it's all for his, his glory and for our good. But if you're here and you're not a believer, you're listening and you're not a believer, I would invite you. I'm more than happy to sit down and talk about these things with you and show you that Jesus is who he claimed to be. That he does fulfill these prophecies like back in Isaiah from a thousand years before he was even born. That he fulfills those prophecies. Even the strangely specific ones like having a grave with the wicked and with the rich man. That's a hard thing to do. But he did it. Amen. Because he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you again this morning and just pray and trust that you would use your word through your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us and convict us and give us clarity, Lord, where, where we need it. You know our hearts even better than we do. You know our minds even better than we do. And we pray that you would Give us that clarity and that guidance and that direction to help us trust you more, to help us submit. Right, to, to, to draw us closer and closer to you and desire to be more obedient to you. But we also pray for those here that may or may be listening that aren't believers. 
that you'd use your word through your Holy Spirit today to start to give them conviction to understand that there's no other explanation for the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus other than that it all happened exactly the way your word says it happened. God, that you place someone in their life, whether it be us or another church or someone else, that, Lord, we, we want them not just to be a part of fair play, more importantly, we want them to be a part of the body of Christ. We want them to be a part of the kingdom. And God, we pray that you place people in their life that would help them to see the truth and to come by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.